Well, we, uh, I, I heard uh, just raving reports about uh, Josh and uh, Michael's sermons the last two Sundays, so I feel a little bit, uh, a little bit of pressure on me today to, to live up to their standards. But uh, we find ourselves continuing in our journey through the Bible, and we are in Psalm 120 this morning. Uh, my sermon is entitled, Changing My Citizenship. So a question that has popped up quite frequently from my lips since I've been here is the question posed to others, what is the gospel? Where should we begin when we share the gospel? We, you've heard me say quite frequently, we need to go and share the good news. And that's, as we all know, is that's what the gospel means, is the good news. And I want to say something this morning to start, and that is that because we live in a culture that is centered around 30-second commercials or meals where we can just stick something in the microwave and it's prepared like that, or we're used to getting our food through a drive through in your minutes, and that if five minutes should pass by, something must be wrong that we couldn't get our meal so quickly, that we want to get our medicines from a pharmacy like this. I remember one time having to go pick up a medication for Luke, and I went in there 25, 30 minutes after it had been called over to find it wasn't there, and I found my, why, why isn't it ready? And, you know, not understanding, you know, it takes time for these things to find their conclusion. But my point in bringing this up as I talk about the gospel is that we are often looking for a quick fix. I walk into a bookstore, and what is it that I see more than anything? Self-help books. Books that, that promote this idea that we can solve all of our problems. And I want to say that the gospel message that incorporates our lives is not some neat and tidy story as we want to make it to be. We can't just package it up and expect that all of the results are going to be shown in 30 minutes or less. In fact, it is a lifelong journey that we are in. That the beginning of the gospel message is what we tend to focus on, and that is the redemptive work of Christ on the cross. That he came to reconcile man to be uh, to be separate or to not be separated from God anymore because of the sin that was in us, but that also the gospel includes the rest of our lives, and that we are to be sanctified, that we are to grow more and more like Christ. We have been set apart. The word that we hear in Scripture, holy. We have been set apart for God, and that we are to be more and more transformed into his likeness. And so we shouldn't be surprised living in the culture that we do, where we want a quick fix, where people are very easily dissatisfied or grumble about the fact that it is a lifelong journey. Uh, in a book that Eugene Peterson wrote, you maybe know the name, it's called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. This is what he used to summarize this very issue. He said, It is not difficult in such a world to get a person interested in the message of the gospel. It is terrifically difficult to sustain that interest. There's a great market in our culture for religious experience, but there is little enthusiasm in the patient acquisition of virtue, little inclination to sign up for long apprenticeship in what earlier generations of Christians called holiness. Let me give you a quick example of this, and that is, and I've heard this out of the mouths of a number of pastors. They'll say, they have said to me, you know, Aaron, I seek to minister and witness and involve and invest and disciple even individual at the individual level, one-on-one. -on -one. And that seems to go fairly well. But then the point comes where they realize that that is not the end. The end then, or the, the next step is for them to go forth and do the same. That we are to take what we learn and pass it along. And so they say, you know, part of that journey in, in any kind of learning is that the teacher gradually steps back. They remove themselves 
And they said, quite frequently, as we step back, people's desires just go away. Now let's pick up our passage this morning, Psalm 120, verses 1 through 7. So it will be up on the screen or you can follow along in your text. It says, In my distress I called to the Lord and he answered me. Deliver me, O Lord, from lying lips, from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given to you, and what more shall be done to you, deceitful tongue? A warrior's sharp arrows with glowing coals of the broom tree. Woe to me that I sojourn to Meshech, that I dwell among the tents of Kedar. Too long have I had my dwelling among those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Now, Psalm 120 is actually the first of 15 ascent psalms in a row. So if you're curious about this, from Psalm 120 through Psalm 134, these are called the ascent psalms. Now, these were songs that would have been sung by the Israelites as they ascended to Jerusalem for their annual, or for their, uh, for their different uh, religious journeys. And so this would have been the first song that they would have sang. Now their trips in some ways have some similarities to what we would use as vacations. Now our vacations are not primarily religious, I'm not comparing that part, but we leave our home, we travel to another place. Now their journey was considerably more difficult than our journey to Michigan, and with three kids it's not necessarily a picnic, but it's nowhere near the difficulty. They were walking the whole way. But, just like is true with our vacations, when the time is up, they were expected to travel back to their home. And so, in Luke chapter 2, we get an example of that, that this was also the practice in Jesus' life. That they, after their vacation, if you will, their traveling to Jerusalem, they were expected to return back to their home. Now, unfortunately, this is a pretty good picture of the lives of many in our society that will label themselves as Christian. They go about their daily lives as however they wish, and then they travel to a building like this on Sunday morning claiming that this is their the answer, that this is the foundation of their faith only to go back out of this building and spend the rest of the 166 hours that make up a week living as though nothing has changed. But this psalm that I just read is really meant to be an antidote, the cure to that kind of life. We read, if you go back through and read that again, we see that the psalmist is fed up with that kind of life. He's in distress. He's sick and tired of traveling to Jerusalem three times a year for this mountaintop experience, only to then return back home to the lies and deceit and lack of peace that he finds on a daily basis. Now at first, it might be hard to see why this would be the first song that they would choose to sing. Why on their way up the mountaintop would, he choose, would they choose to sing this song first? But I believe that after looking through this more, there is a logical reason for this. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. And that is my sermon in a sentence that comes from this first song. The first step in our journey to becoming a mature disciple of Jesus is changing our citizenship. Now, as I've already pointed to, the psalmist is very fed up with his daily life. He's frustrated about the fact that he has to continually live in the midst of the ungodly. So he first sojourns to Meshech. Now, the word for sojourn in here indicates that it was only a temporary home, just as we think of when we go on vacation. We go on a temporary trip. Meshach was one of the sons of Japheth, whose descendants settled in Asia Minor, to the north of Jerusalem. Now he also, in this text, claimed to dwell among the tents of Kedar. Now this word, interestingly enough, the word for dwell, 
indicates a little bit more of a permanent home. But even with that in mind, the people that lived in Qadar were known to be nomadic. They traveled to and fro. So it might be in the same way where you might take uh, a, a shorter trip with the point of you're going you're gonna to move to Grove City, as we did for whatever season there is, and then we're going to move on, or whomever is going to move on when that time comes. So there's, it's not a permanent home, but it's more permanent than just going on a vacation. Now the psalmist here is clearly using poetic, figurative language to picture the fact that in our daily lives, those who seek to live lives and need to live or have to live their lives among the ungodly are characterized by two traits. So those who are ungodly, let me rephrase that here, those that are living apart from God's lives are characterized by two things. Lies and deceit and their hatred for peace. So in the midst of this distress that the psalmist finds himself, he calls out to the Lord, and the Lord answers his prayer. Now it's interesting, and I encourage you to go back and read this afterwards again, but the Lord answers his prayer, but when you read the rest of that psalm, it sure doesn't sound like he's taken that in as an answer to prayer. He still continues to, uh, to complain a little bit, and to be frustrated, and to be dissatisfied with what is going on. He's lamenting about life. And so we can only really find an answer in verse 4 of the text. And that is the fate of the deceitful tongue. And so one of the things we may find is that in this story, that the answer to prayer is in the journey itself. It isn't necessarily in some specific answer to a specific prayer, but it may be God is taking us winding around the road so that we will learn something in the long run. We may want the quick answer to a phone that's gone, gone tapped into someone else is taking it, but maybe God will use this in a way, I pray that God will use this in a way, one, to continue to say to us, you know what, it's material. And yes, we don't want to see this happen, but it is material. And, 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 and on the other hand, God, we want to see movement in the hearts of those who, who see that as acceptable or, or condonable uh, activity. And so it is, part of it is in the journey itself, that God is actually rescuing this psalmist from his nomadic life. He doesn't want them to just live in the mindset of being surrounded by the heathens, but he allows him this annual trip, or this three-time-a-year trip to Jerusalem. And you know who he's surrounded by? By similar people who are dissatisfied with their current reality. They're dissatisfied with the world, so they go to a place where they can worship their God. They find a brief respite from the world around them, both during the journey and in their time in Jerusalem. And again, while he has to return to his home after the feast, he was determined he was no longer going to live as a citizen of the world. Now, if we are going to, to develop into mature disciples, then we too have to come to a place where we are fed up with our culture. And we are fed up with being citizens of this world. Because you know what? Like it or, like it or not, we're, this is where we live. This is our physical location. But we need to continue to develop the mindset that we are no longer primarily citizens of this world. We're not even primarily citizens of this nation. That is our earthly residence. In fact, more recently, I've, I've heard about this a lot over the last, I'd say, year, that we are, I am con consistently seeing more of the usage of the phrase citizens of the world as there's been, being a shift in that direction uh, in so many places. And there's actually a place now that if you want, and I'm not encouraging this, but where you can sign up to become a citizen of the world. So it's a movement that's being made um, for a number of, of reasons. 
But we need to, instead of focusing on what the world is promoting, we need to go back to Scripture and ask ourselves, what does it say? And it's very clear in Paul's writings in Philippians chapter 3. He says, Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. It almost sounds like Paul has Psalm 120 in mind when he wrote those words. He makes it clear that, like the psalmist, when it comes to the place that we dwell, we need to realize that our dwelling place is not here. Our eternal dwelling place is somewhere else. And so we must, in return, in light of that, live as citizens of heaven. But that's much easier said than done. You know, I can think of quite a few scripture passages that I could quote uh, that would probably resonate with the situation that was brought up this morning. Uh, and, and yet, uh, you know, it's still... It's, it's much, you know, about how to forgive and to show love. And it becomes much more uh, real. Our faith is refined when we deal with some of these things about how do we handle this? How do we balance justice and love? How do we find ways to use the things that happen in our life, both good and evil, to bring glory to God? <coughs> now, the psalmist here gives us some insight as to how are some good steps to transfer our citizenship to heaven. And so the first thing that we do is we say no to the lies of this world. See, we live in a world that constantly bombards us with lies. And because we face them so frequently, it's easy to buy into these lies ourselves and to live based on these lies as well. I don't, I don't remember who said it, but someone once said, if you, lie, if, you, if you tell a lie loud enough and long enough, people will begin to believe that it's the truth. And so with that in mind, I felt compelled as I read through this to really dig at or hit at on the, those three of the major lies that we see in our world that have also, in some cases, in many cases, filtered into some of the churches that we see. And I found it important to address these things this morning. And so the first big lie that I want to address is that man is basically good. Now survey after survey shows that the, that, uh, the average American overwhelmingly believes that man is basically good. In fact, I even came across some polls that would indicate that that percentage is, basically, is around 83%. Now, there was an article that was written I, I, that I found, and I thought it was interesting to share this. It was a little confusing, so I may take a minute and try to explain briefly what he's saying. But this is the guy that actually founded Scientology. So I want you to understand here that he's coming from a very secular view, and that's why I want to be careful to explain what it is he's saying after I read it. But this is what he wrote. Years ago, I discovered and proved that man is basically good. This means that the basic personality and intentions of the individual towards himself and others are good. When a person finds himself committing too many harmful acts against the dynamics, whatever those are, he becomes his own executioner. This gives us the proof that man is basically good. When he finds himself committing too many evils, then causatively, whether unconsciously or unwittingly, Man places ethics on himself by destroying himself, and he does himself in without the assistance from anyone else. 
The criminal who leaves clues behind is doing so in hopes that someone will come along to stop him from continuing to harm others. He is basically good and does not want to harm others. And in the absence of the ability to stop himself outright, he attempts to put ethics in on himself by getting thrown in prison where he will no longer be able to commit crimes. So let me just pause for a second, because there's a lot loaded in there. And so you may find yourself thinking, okay, what in the world is he actually saying here? So let me just try to clear this up if there's any confusion. He is, what he is saying here is that because, in his view, man is essentially good by nature, that even when evil happens, man will eventually, it's, it's kind of like there's a threshold. Once I get to the threshold, then any human being will know, well, I've got to put these rules in place. I don't need help from anyone else to help me realize that there is maybe a different way in life. I can just do it myself. And then he goes on to say, well, every criminal, you know, if, if there are clues left behind, it's because they're wanting to get caught. They want to go, they'd rather than go into prison so that they don't have to, to live with this because, you know, after all, they are basically good. Now, I could say a whole lot of things in response to that. But what I am going to say is that I'm going to go back to the beginning of the 20th century. And so there were even, there were, you know, there were even some liberal theologians who were saying, and we still hear this today, this is not, a new, this is not gone away completely, but they say humanity, human nature is basically good. And that they only need proper training and education in order to learn to do good. Okay, keep in mind, I just if they, these were liberal theologians. These are messages that are coming from the church at the beginning of the 20th century, not all churches. And then, then you look at what happens in the 20th century. It was the bloodiest century in recorded history. Now, as incredulous as these words may sound, that I just read, that is, like it or not, that is the common, prevalent view in our culture. You may laugh about it, you may say, how in the world could they believe this? It's the prevalent belief in our culture. In fact, it even filters into some of our, it filters into my language sometimes too, about how easily it is to turn and say, talk about how good this person is. Most people, including ourselves, at times, not always, but we believe this lie. People believe this lie that we are basically good. But where it really fits in here is, well, if something happens to me, it must have been an outside force. You know, if something happened, if somebody else was the cause of something that's going on in my life. We want to blame other people. We want to blame the situations that are out there. We maybe want to blame our upbringing. You know what? It's my parents' fault because they didn't do this for me. Or they did this to me. Or it's my, I didn't, you know, it was my friend's fault. They just weren't the kind of friends that were good to be around. Forget about the fact that maybe I need to take some responsibility for that. And so we lie. We believe. We live on. We rest on this lie that man is basically good, which leads to the second conclusion, or the second lie, and that is that Man can earn citizenship in heaven. This lie is perpetuated even more so by the process of becoming a citizen here in the U.S., that there are simply a list of requirements with which you need to fulfill, and once you've checked off those boxes, you are good to go. And so it's really no surprise that we can take that in and, and say, well, this must be the way it is. And I tell you, in the interactions that I have, I can tell you again, this is, agree with it or not, I, I disagree with this, with this, let's lie, but this is the prevalent view in our society. You know, and, and we, we don't, most people won't tell you that. They won't say, well, I believe that, it, that, I, that I can earn it. 
they'll go out and say, well, look at the good that I have done. And all this good, you know, certainly God's going to accept me because I've done all of these good things. And sure, yeah, I've done some bad things over here, but it's, I've done this. And this is what, you know, surely God's going to overlook those things. And he will, but not for that reason. The only reason God can overlook sin is because of Christ. And, so the, and then the third lie is the last one, and I, I, I believe it's the most damaging that we see in people's lives. And that is, because of what I've done, this kind of takes a different tact on it, but because of what I've done, God can't possibly love me. Have you ever met anyone that's told you that? Who said, you know, I, you know, I've done so many bad things, how could God love me? People are out there in our midst living in despair. They feel so terrible about what they have done, and so they've bought into the lie that, you know what, I, because I'm supposed to be trying to earn my way in, what am I to do now? Maybe I'm just not one of the good people. Maybe I'm not one of the chosen people, and so therefore I've got a different lot in my life. See, if we really believe that we can earn salvation, then we also, as a natural byproduct, realize, believe that we can lose God's love somehow. And so the first thing we need to do in order to transfer our uh, citizenship to heaven is to say, no, these are, these are lies. We're not going to claim those things in our lives because they are not the truth. But it isn't just enough to say no to those lies. We need to say yes to the truth. So maybe the question that you have is, how do I respond to someone? Maybe you're sitting there saying, well, yeah, I, I hear people say that all the time, but I don't know what to say to them. You know, I, how, how do I address someone that tells me I'm, I'm going to earn my way to heaven or I'm a good person? You know, it's, it, it sounds a lot easier in our minds until you stand in front of someone and say, yeah, I'm a good person or, you know, so-and-so is a good person. They don't need anything else. So I'm going to try to address those things today. It's all in John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, we read that Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And so how do we push back against these three lies? And there are many other lies. I could have listed these are just three big ones in our culture. The answer is with the truth of Scripture. And so here are the three truths. They're very closely related to the lies, which is how Satan works. He twists the truth just a half degree. And I'm going to give you some scripture to use as a reference point. So first of all, man is not basically good. Now this should be evident to us, I think, fairly clearly when we look around. Now how many of you, raise your hand, if you had kids, and you had to teach your kids about how to sin? However, even though that's easy to observe, we can observe that, we want the base of truth to be also ingrained in Scripture. That just in an in experience, we can say, it's pretty clear. But we're not going to rest on experience alone, because that can be dangerous too. So, here's a couple of passages that reflect on who we really are. So, Psalm chapter 14, The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand who seek after God. They have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. And if you want to say, well, well wait a second, Pastor, that's an Old Testament verse. We live in the New Covenant now, and so now things are different. So don't quote me your Old Testament stuff. Give me the New Testament stuff. Okay, John cha or, uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 22 and 23. For there is, for there is no distinction... For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all, I mean, one sin makes us a lawbreaker. One sin gives us the one thing that we deserve, and that's death. So that's, that is our foundation of what we deserve, but we can be joyful, and the reason we have hope is because we know that's not our end. God joyfully gives us and, and graciously gives us this freedom, but it is not through our earning it. Point two here, or the second truth. 
Because man is not basically good, we have nothing to offer him in terms of earning our salvation. Now, again, as I referenced earlier, some would claim that this is somehow a new idea in the, in the New Testament. That somehow they had to earn it in the past, and now, well, this is a new, God's changed his mind and his tact, and so he's doing something different. Again, I'm going to give you a scripture from the Old and New Testament. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. And in the New Testament, for by grace, Ephesians chapter 2, by grace you have been saved. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of any works, so that no one may boast. And finally, no matter what you have done, so if there's anyone in here that's in this camp that feels that has felt this way or feels this way, no matter what you've done, God still loves you. Because you can do nothing in and of your own works to earn God's favor. There's also nothing you can do to make God love you less. Let's consider Romans chapter 5, verses 7 to 10. It says, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a, pers a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, God or Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if we were enemies and we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Jesus died on the cross for you and for me. Even though he knows all of your sins, past and present and future. There is nothing that would demonstrate his love any more clearer than that. And so we need to continue to say no to the lies of this world and yes to the truth that God gives us through Scripture. Now I want to close with one final thought here, and that is around the topic of repentance. And you've heard me use that word quite a bit, and, and I would even go as far as saying that the first step, how do we change citizen if you want citizenship? How do we if you wanted me to give you one word, that one word is repentance. Now you've often probably been told that repentance means to change directions. And it does, but there's an alternative meaning, and it's to it means to change allegiances, to change sides. And so, repentance is not merely an emotion. So for those of you that have young kids, you can relate to the, process, the stage we are in lives where it isn't just, oh, I'm sorry about that, or I'm crying about that, and 30 seconds later I'm doing the same thing again. Repentance is not simply feeling sorry for our sins. No, that is important. You've got to feel sorry for them, but that's not the end result. Repentance is a decision to actually change. The underlying Greek word that's used, as I said, is to change one's mind. We need to change our mind from the lies that the world gives to us to the truth that God presents to us. It is changing allegiances and living under the authority of God. And until you make the decision to repent, it's, it is impossible to go any further in the process of becoming a mature disciple. We see this was true. I mean, take a look at the life that Abraham lived. He had, initially, he was in a place where there was a vast amount of wisdom, and there was, he had strength, and there were riches. He could have lived off the land, but he chose instead to trust God. He could have put all of his trust into the things of this world, but instead God told him, no, that is not to be your life. That is not what is important. And so he gave up all those things. And later on, we found, even though they were in captivity, many of the Israelites, even though they were slaves, they 
after coming out of it, actually found they preferred to stay in slavery. They, could, they, they, they were fed food. They, they knew consistently they would get these things, even though their lives uh, had to be incredibly difficult labor. And yet God calls them away from these, these kingdoms into the place of his plan. Was there anyone in here... You know, I've heard people say this. I've never personally had someone say this directly. I've, I've heard people say this kind of third hand, but this idea that when we're saved, things are just going to get peachy, to use Brett's word. Things are just going to be smooth sailing and that there's never going to be any problems in our lives. Well, we see in Scripture that was not the case. And so we need to realize that we're going to continue to suffer. We're going to have things, but make sure that what you're suffering for is for, for Christ. And take encouragement that as you suffer for Christ, that you are in this journey towards him. That whether life makes, seems to be good or seems to be hard, take joy in the pursuit of who Christ is. Don't chase after anybody telling you about this instant spirituality that they claim to have found. We all, it gets offered in so many places. I know firsthand churches now that are telling you, you don't just you don't need Jesus. These are quote unquote Christian churches that are saying there are so many ways. You don't need Jesus. I know pastors who, one in particular, who I had a respect for, whose life, don't know why, took quite a drastic change, and now he is one of the prominent, on the national level, speakers against it, against Jesus' uh, faith and faith in Christ alone. Don't be sucked into the fact that Tomorrow, you know, if today you get saved, tomorrow you're going to be, you're going to be fully sanctified. It's a lifelong journey. You've got to say no to the lies of the world. And I, I want to just one other thing God just placed in my mind. It comes back from Sunday school this morning. The question was asked to me. I'm still not going to be able to give a, a a quick, concise sentence answer like was asked of me this morning. But was why do I why why, why should we go to church? Why should we be a part of a church? And so uh, I'm just going to give you a snapshot. And then it's, when we look at this, how quick it is that we can be dragged into the lies of this world. We find, you know, we struggle, you know, we may be struggling with something, whatever that something is. And all of a sudden, a lie gets placed before us, but that lie sure seems like it would help us in our current situation. If I could just believe this, then it kind of settles me down a little bit. It gets me so that I don't have to feel so bad about what's going on in my life. For example, God doesn't allow, you know, God never gives you more than you can handle. That sure sounds really awesome, doesn't it? Thank you for that. It, it sounds great. It, God never gives you more than you can handle. I had that conversation with someone this week here in town. If he did, why do you need God? Scripture does not say that. So these, what I'm talking about here is these subtle lies that we find in our culture that we just, if we're not well grounded, we just kind of take them in. We consume them and we think, oh, that, you know, I don't really believe that, but it becomes a part of our makeup. And all of a sudden, we start telling people, you know, I know you're going through a difficult time, but God will handle it. Don't worry about it. God's got this. Well, you know what? Sometimes we have to go through some junk in our lives to realize God's got this. God is in control. To see how God, God's going to get the glory. And that oftentimes comes through the difficult and challenging things that we have to endure. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you again 
And I can't say this enough for your word, for your truth. Lord, we know that there are so many uh, subtle and pernicious lies that are abounding in our culture. We know that you have told us that Satan is the author of lies. And it's also very clear to us that the lies that he gives us in so many circumstances are devious, Lord. They are lies that may, the lies that we are given may be different than the lies of the person sitting next to us, Lord. That they are lies that are easier for us to buy into, Lord. So I pray for discernment, Lord, but that discernment comes only through prayer and through diligent studies, Lord. So I pray for a continuing a uh, heart of, of, of study and of, of uh, accountability to one another, encouraging one another to really dig into the words, challenging one another, looking at what it is that is going on in our world, being willing to, to ask someone, hey, you know what, you're telling me that, that Scripture says God will never give us more than we can handle, and I would say differently, Lord. Give us that, that desire to be in such a relationship here with one another, where we can have these kinds of conversations and ask ourselves, what is it that God has given us? What is the truth that God has given us? And, and, and in what ways have we seen lies that have been filtered into our lives? Because we know no one in this room, and I'll even use Paul's, a phrase from Paul's vocabulary, you know, I, I would be the greatest, the first among those who have, have misconceptions in my mind. I know that those things are a part of us because we are fallen and we will not have complete understanding this side of eternity. So Lord, give us humility and a a heart to learn, Lord, that the Christian walk didn't end the moment we accepted Christ. That's when it began. So give us a hunger so that as we go out this morning that we will truly live into that call that we are sent to uh, make disciples for you. Amen. Please stand for the benediction and the closing song. Finally, brothers and sisters, I want you to rejoice. And in this week, aim for restoration. Comfort one another, agree with one another, and live in peace. And that let the God of love and find him and let the peace that he offers be with you now and forevermore. And remember, church, you are sent. Go and be missionaries for Christ this week.